Hello. Thanks very much to the Emlet team to allow us to come over and talk a little bit about what we've done and maybe to explain a bit why we use the Emlet products for our, for our purposes. Um, we're a, a drone mapping company based in South Africa. Um, we do mainly flight operations all over Africa, East Africa, Central Africa. We focus on large-scale areas, uh, 1,000 hectares up to about 35,000 hectares, mainly in the mining industry as well as construction. Um, the project that I'm going to detail here today is uh, some work that we do in Lesotho. Uh, Lesotho is a landlocked country. It's landlocked by South Africa. It's a really mountainous place. Um, most of the land is about 2,800 meters above sea level. Um, it's quite a poor country. It doesn't have very much infrastructure and get, to get around the country is quite quite tough. Um, it has some heavy temperature extremes in summer it can get up well over 35 degrees and winter time it's often frozen. Main exports is diamonds, gemstones and other mining activities. The site that we are demonstrating here today is the diamond mine. Uh, the diamonds in this part of the world form from kimberlite pipes that have eroded away. Uh, the kimberlite pipes were from volcanic extrusions that formed the landscape. Uh, the site, or well, the operational area of the site varies from 2,900 to 3,200 meters above sea level. Uh, the, the, the project, the, or the, the mine is, is, is still in its infancy. Um, the, 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 the pits that they are planning on, on on digging out or excavating or planning on going down as deep as 200 meters below the surface. Um, the clients approached us with a few requirements. They basically wanted us to come over fairly regularly, so it was once a month. Uh, they'd like an, an author mosaic of the entire site. Uh, the reason being is they visually wanted to inspect the, the site um, of the, the entire of the site, but various stakeholders were all based all over the world. So for them to come to the site was, was, was an impossibility, but this could be quite easy to share information about the conditions of the site. Uh, they, they really wanted to visually inspect uh, erosion control, the design and maintenance of haul roads, of the milling plants, etc. And also for the dams, for, for both for slime, for reducing the um, evaporation ponds, etc. Um, they wanted a consistent approach, and one was, was fairly cheap. So the first part of the project was to place some primary control. The, the control had to last for about five years, and then we'd have to reevaluate it. Because the site was is in quite an extreme uh, environment with uh, demolition, explosions from demolitions taking place, that uh, pillar beacons and so on were forming our, our initial control, and those had to be surveyed to about a millimeter. Those were used to um, also figure out, you know, for monitoring purposes for our for the dam levels, etc. Um, it, further control was then placed with the GPS. Uh, those control were, were, the accuracy wasn't really required to be too high, so we used those for photogrammetry. Uh, aircraft setup for this is, is quite a challenge. Since the site is at about 10,000 feet, uh, you need a fairly specific aircraft for it. The aircraft obviously needs to carry all your sensors, uh, such as the PPK system, as well as a full-frame camera. Um, and it needs to be able to cope with, with the limited landing area that you have. Despite in this photograph looking like you have a very large area, it's basically a, an eroded volcano. Um, so there's very little place for you to land on. 
uh, the the strong winds around uh, make a landing and takeoff quite a challenge as well as fly tops. In terms of the PPK system that we use, this is the bog standard reach that you that everyone can get, but that we've tied it into the camera system. For logging, you can see the two bases in the background. That's just a normal reach RS base. And it's still logging. You can go. No problem. It's not a very good photograph, anyway. <laughs> okay. So for flight planning for the area, the area is fairly small. This is not uh, typical for what we do, but it is an indication, I suppose, of the challenges for flight planning. Uh, we decided to determine what the average operational area, where the client was really focusing on their, their earthworks or their activities, and from that level we decided to to provide them with a 78 percent side lap the reason being is that we would have a little bit of a buffer for those areas that were perhaps higher than the average operational area at the ex extremes of the site um, we didn't really require much coverage since it was was just for author photo purposes it just so happened that the only landing area that we could could find was this tiny area up at top um, it ended up being about 50 meters by 50 meters wide and it was much higher than the, the, uh, the surrounding terrain so we, we ended up flying five meters below us um, this is slightly bleak to show how um, rugged the terrain actually is and that shows a graph of the, the profile, the blue being the terrain, and this is our flight level. Interestingly, we actually had to climb to land, which is not normal. <laughs> so the reach RS uh, setup involved the, the normal reach uh, on board, logging at 14 hertz with GPS. The reason being for this is that we find that in this part of the world, as you can see, the horizon is very clear. There's almost no obstructions that we can pull our, our elevation mask right down to about five degrees and still be quite comfortable. The reason why we're using GPS only is because we need quite a high refresh rate. So our cruise speed is really fast up in this part of the world. So we, we had to have it logging fast enough so that we didn't interpolate between points. We ended up interpolating probably at about 1.1 meter or so between points. We use two bases for redundancy. So each one of the REACH RS bases was censored over a, a point that we had previously measured. Um, these, we, the reason why we use two is for redundancy, but also for uh, giving dual measurements when we pr calculate our baselines or our process our baselines out. The reach camera is then fed back, or uh, well the camera, each time the camera triggers, there's a feedback that makes an event mark on the raw data. So, flight tops, this is a great challenge at this part of the world, um, mainly because of the low air density. Uh, 10,000 feet is pretty high. And uh, we find that typically you'll have an increase in the cruise speed. Uh, the stall speed is dramatically increases and the turn diameters are reduced. So you, you fly fast and you don't have much control uh, and you use a lot of power. We also struggle with the landing area, as I mentioned, it was fairly small. It was only 50 meters by 50 meters. We ended up during this flight actually having the wind turn around completely upon us and necessitated in designing very quickly a, a, a new approach. 
Um, so we had to put the aircraft into a, a loiter while we designed a new approach and then brought it in. It would be very difficult for even an experienced pilot to manually bring in the aircraft in such conditions. So the raw data that we collected were about 800 images. We overcompensated for the amount of images that we collected. The reason being is that we realized that the cruise speed was going to be fairly fast. So we would like to capture as many images as possible to try and compensate for the forward lap. Uh, those are full frame, 100 meg, uh, uh, I beg your pardon, 42 megapixel images. So it's a fair amount of data. Um, the two bases running, we collected the raw data from that in UBX format and then the rover on the aircraft also in UBX format. We then proce processes it out. Uh, we use both, uh, both uh, bases as a baseline to give uh, dual residuals and uh, came up with some pretty good uh, fixed epochs. So as you can see, uh, we almost had 100% of the flight was covered. That's even while we're standing over the aircraft, busy fiddling around with the camera, etc. and after landing. Um, the error or the expected error uh, that the software tells us is less than five centimeter for the entire flight this is more than this is probably true we probably got about four centimeters something like that for each one of our observations there are still some small little timing issues but those are fairly negligible then for the photogrammetric, photogrammetric processing, uh, all the images are loaded into the standard uh, PIX4D. We do set it up or change it a little bit of our parameters for PPK use. Uh, it's not exactly the same as when you use uh, normal ground control. Uh, the important thing to note here is that we didn't use any ground control whatsoever for the alignment of the model. This is not the recommended way, but it illustrates here how good the model can be by not using control. This is not what we handed our clients at the end, but this shows how good the model actually can be without control. So we then produced an author mosaic. Uh, we also produced a point cloud, and then through classification, we spent a large amount of time classifying out the, the buildings, the plants, the equipment, water, uh, vegetation, etc. And we produce a, a fairly clean uh, point cloud that's representative only of the terrain. From that terrain, we formed a DTM, or meshed a DTM together uh, and identified the control points that we previously placed and uh, digitized the coordinate from it and then interpolated a value or a height value from it and then we could give a digitized coordinate of our control and from that control we could then tabulate and compare and now this is the, probably the highlight of the entire thing although in, unless it, 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 it doesn't look very dramatic but these numbers are actually quite exciting what it shows us is our digitized coordinates uh, compared to our coordinates from that we surveyed and then our, our residuals or our, our survey finds our actual digitized coordinates. As you can see, those residuals are, are pretty good. Uh, our resolution that we generated was on our author photo was about a centimeter and a half, something like that. So the control points were really clear. Uh, the control points were also placed on fairly flat areas, uh, so there was no discrepancy on the heights uh, where we were interpolating over. So it, it, the numbers look almost too good to be true. What is interesting is that over the months and multiple flight operations, we're seeing a consistency between these, these values. They're repeatedly the same over and over. So our client doesn't pay us to fly a drone. They look for some data, surprisingly. Uh, we produce uh, an author photo for them. We resample it down to about six centimeter or something useful. One centimeter or something like that is useless. The guys don't have the software to be able to deal with that kind of resolution. 
we give them a classified point cloud. Generally, it works out a density of about 10 points per square meter, uh, which is more than sufficient for their needs. We give them profiles wherever they have some questions for us about wanting to know what the landscape is looking like, contours, and then a DTM. Still, some software that our clients are using is fairly, fairly old, and it, it can't deal with the mass numbers of points that we give them. So we have to resample it to show only salient points or where there's a massive change in, in elevation. And then when needed, we give them some volumetric calculations too. As you can see, there's some uh, profile and some contours. So the reason why we've chosen the PPK system to include in all our aircraft comes down to comes down to the point that it is a simple to use and cost effective system. But the most important reason is it gives repeatable and reliable results. We, we, we very seldom see a change in the refresh rate of, of what we are measuring at. We, we, we know what to expect when we include it in our system and in our workflow. But we've also learned that with people becoming more and more accustomed to the term PPK, it seems to be synonymous with the idea that you don't need ground control. This is nothing further from the truth. You really do still need ground control. It's recommended that you still use ground control for your surveys with PPK because it really does strengthen up your block, especially on the outside limits of your model where you have less tie points to actually strengthen the model and it starts to deviate. That's where you really still do not need ground control. When you combine control and PPK together, you, you're going to get good results, and this is the way you should be doing it. You also need to be able to prove to your clients or to your peers around you what your accuracies really are. You need to be able to report on them, look, this is what I'm actually getting at the end of the day for my accuracy, and not what the software is telling you what you think your accuracy is really about. We also find that this PPK system from, from MLID is good for about 10 kilometer radius around them. It can be ex 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 extrapolated further to about 10, 10 kilometers further, so say 20 kilometers radius, but the error does st start to increase a little bit. For that, we recommend using another reach base and using dual-based line processing. Thank you very much for listening to me.